it wasn't always a bad time, you know, at home. Sometimes they had some some fun times. It weren't very often, but they were there. I remember once when I used to keep pigeons as a kid, but I kept them on Porky Sefton's uh, veranda in the tenements because his mother didn't mind. Porky's dad was uh, had died some years before, and and uh, between the two of us, we built a pigeon loft on, on the veranda. Uh, I was always welcome there at Porky's, and I had some good laughs with them. I remember one time we were, we were going to, uh, we used to go around the, down the docks and climb up on the overhead railway, looking for p young pigeons, getting collecting pigeons and one thing or another. We used to sell them sometimes to some of the other kids in the tenements, and some of them we kept, we always kept the ones that we thought would be good. And uh, I remember one time, well, a few times actually. We went down down the town, we ran by St George's Hall, and uh, Porky said, "There's always pigeons going over there in the, on that library roof. There seems to be a big opening in there." He said, "Why don't we get some? Uh, go over there and see what, how, if we can get up." So we took a stroll over. I couldn't really believe what we what we started to do. We got our practice, these big pillars going up, they must have been 45, 50 foot high, from what I can remember. There were pillars in, in the front of the, St George's Hall. And just past the pillars was like a big opening. I don't know where, probably where there was people used to get up there and do some talk. And I don't know what it was for, but we decided to take a climb up it. So what we did, we got our backs against the pillar and we put one foot on the wall, on the building itself, and the other leg we put behind us on the pillar, and we moved up. We only went up a little way at first, and I said to Porky, we could easily do this. And we did, and we went all the way up to the top. And the, the hardest part was getting from the pillar, because my back was against the pillar, and so was Porky's. And the hard part was getting from there and leaning over and grabbing hold of the, the um, I don't know what they call it, but it was a big, big piece of um, sandstone and all that right around the edges, so we had to grab hold of it. So I, I went first for some reason, and I just lifted me back off the pillar so that it was just a leg on the building and a leg on the pillar behind me. And I, I found it so easy just to move forward and grab the building. And the porky came after me. Oh, when we got up there, we thought we were in heaven. We, all these pigeons that must have been roosting there for, for years, you know, in and out, in and out, dead pigeons, everything, and nests all over the place. We went over, and we were getting the young pigeons, because they're, they're all the pigeons, you know, you couldn't get them. They were just flying out the way. So, so we went around looking for the young pigeons that we could probably take back to the loft in, a, in Porky's house, Porky's uh, veranda. And we did this, and we were made up. I had about six pigeons down my shirt, <laughs> but, be, but Porky was the same. And I said, how are we going to get down? I said, we'll have to go back down the same way. He said, well, how are we going to get our leg on that pillar? I said, what we'll have to do? Because Porky always did what I told him for some reason, maybe because I could fight him. And, you know, <laughs> it was a bit of a hard case or whatever. Um, so what I said, I said, I'll get hold of this. Sandstone, the, 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 I forget what they, you'd call it. There's like a perimeter around the edge of the top of the building. Cornish. I got hold of it, can't, yeah. And I got hold of it, and I just leaned back and I looked back and seen where the pillar was, and I just let go and fell against the pillar. Okay. And I, I thought, oh, that was all right, that. And I got my leg on the pillar behind me, and I went down the, the pillar like that, and the porky came down after me. <laughs> and uh, got to the bottom, and I said, I'm sweating here. Yeah. He said, oh, I said, so am I. And I put my hand in my shirt to get pigeons. And when I pulled, they were dead. I fell on them and I I'd squashed them on my back. I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, we've got all that. And I've got, only got two pigeons. You guys are dead. They're all around me. I'm all around me back and everywhere. Oh, I was, I was, you know, right. But we couldn't stop laughing. We, we threw them away. Obviously, we just got rid of them. But we, we got like two or three pigeons out of it, which was uh, which is some sort of reward, as far as we were concerned. 
Because uh, that, that was the one thing you seem to happen to when you're a kid, if you're getting treated badly, you seem to like get to love, love animals because they seem to be as helpless as you are yourself. And it was a, just an amazing thing. We were always together all the time, Corby. Anyway, when we went down to the, to the library, it was, by St George's Hall, Liverpool, it, we went, came back and put the pigeons in the porky's place because it was in the afternoon when we went down. And we went strolling off and we went down to Edge of we went, we walked, unless we jumped on the back of a, a wagon as it was going past and it wasn't going through fast. But we had started to go down to Edge Hill at the, um, the railway station. Because uh, we used to have a laugh around there. There was all sorts of stuff on the ground, and you could have a laugh. You could run around. Nobody could catch you. Nobody could stop you. It was all pretty wide open. And this time we went down. They must. They were whitewashing all all the walls around the station, doing it all up a little bit, tarting us up as you say. And there's all this lime just left in a big heap by the wall. So me and Porky went down looking at it, and Porky just started drawing with it on the wall, big round bit of face, and we started. I said, let's go get some of these things and throw them at, the, see if we can hit, hit the face at like a target. So we, we took a few lumps of lime, went back, went, went back a few yards and that, and started throwing it and hitting this thing and this target that we made. And we, we thought it was, we had a bit of fun. Until I went down to get a few more pieces of lime from this big heap. And as I, I bent down, I picked about three or four pieces up. And as I stood up, as I turned around, I just felt bang right in my face. And my face started burning. My eyes were burning. And I just dropped. I was screaming at the top of my voice. What the Porky had done, unbeknownst to me, he was throwing at this target, still throwing. And I didn't know that I bent down in front of it, underneath, picking some more lime up. And as I stood up and turned around, Porky had let go of the piece yeah. of lime. I didn't, obviously didn't see it. I smacked me right in the eyes, right in the face. All my eyes were, were screaming that much as some people came running down the passageway. See what has, you know, to Porky said what had happened. He grabbed me, never even had time for an ambulance. They stopped the bus and got me down to St. Uh, St. Paul's Eye Hospital. And I was in there, St. Paul's getting my eyes washed out, screaming at the top of my voice, shouting, and they must have given me something to sedate me or something because I said, I started, you know, not feeling what was going on and it all just went quiet and I don't even remember going home, getting taken home, but apparently I got taken home. Um, and when I did come round after all this, uh, whatever it is they'd give me, I could still walk, I knew what was going on, but I just, I just didn't feel it like, until I got home. And uh, funnily enough, I was put in the same room as where I'd nicked a five shilling from of our John, yeah. and I was actually put on his bed to, to, to rest, and the first time I'd ever really been looked after in that house, 275, and my eyes were burning, and I just couldn't see a thing. And looking back now, it, it was actually something that was going to happen to me later in my life. Yeah. I was just out going blind, and I was blind for about, must have been about a week. And uh, I used to go down to the high hospital every day, and they just had two pieces of gauze over my eyes with pinholes in them. And I was told that... <coughs> The minute I seen any light at all, I was to tell me, as they call it, me mother, me mum, I would say. I was to tell me mum that she was to bring me straight back down to St. Paul's. Well, I didn't think I was ever going to see again. I just laid on that bed. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to go anywhere. Until one morning I woke up and I just see this little bit of light. And I told me mum. And... Uh, we walked down to Liverpool I was like, look, yeah, this is in the town. And I'm, I've got eye problems here, serious eye problems. And we didn't even have the money to get the bus. We walked down the town to the Liverpool I was like, and went straight in. They put me on a chair and 
start to clean my eyes out with fluid or whatever it was. And gradually, after a couple of months, I got my eyesight back. So I was a very, very lucky. But uh, I, used to, I used to go through all sorts. I remember one time going to, uh, they used to have a, a show in Liverpool. It was called the, uh, the Wavy Tree Show. And people used to go there from all over the country. They'd put, they'd put tents up and they'd have be a fair there, to be horses, to be everything you could think of in them days. You know, it was a big thing. And they'd have all these tents up. And I was walking around. And I was with John this time. It was another mate of mine who used to have budgies in his... He was the same. He was one of their seven kids. He was the eldest of seven. Uh, but his father had died as well. A lot of people, a lot of his fathers had died during the war and one thing or another. And John Old just had his mother. She was a lovely woman. She really was. She just used to look after me. And we went to the Wavy Tree show and we were walking in these tents just looking. And one of them had loads and loads of cages with budgie guys in them. Budgies, as we called them. And John was made up because he kept budgies. And he's going, oh, look at this, look at this one. Look at them. He kept telling me all the colours of them and everything. And he was going, wow. I said, well, should we get some after? He said, oh, do you mean should we get some? He said, you can't get these. And I said, we can. I said, look, they're only in tents. They're not going to take the tents down every night, are they? I said, we'll come back after, climb over the fence. I said, we'll just climb them to get underneath the the, uh, the tents. Just lift the side of the tents up and get in, climb in. You know, just crawl underneath. So we did. What we did, we borrowed a couple of bikes. Because everybody had our bikes in them days. And I got this old bike off one of John's mates. I said, just lend us. We'd only go down to Wave Street Park and we'd be back. And we did the same thing as we did at St. George's Oak. We got, climbed underneath, got underneath the tent. We were up in the cage, we grabbed the budgies and shoved them down our shirts. But only this time, they weren't getting, they weren't getting killed because they weren't leaning on anything. And I must have had about 30 budgies in the shirt. John was the same and we were laughing our heads off. We got back to our bikes. <laughs> Only the thing was, we were going down Smith Down Road, and uh, the next thing was budgies flying out the shed. <laughs> we were absolutely, we couldn't stop laughing. We couldn't ride our bikes for laughing. The budgies were flying out everywhere. I said, well, if we fasten our shirts, we'll be able to go faster because the budgies are flying. And, you know, we did things like that. Which, you know, it sounds ridiculous at the time, but in them days, that was, to us, that was an extremely happy time. We had an absolutely good laugh. We got to John O's. We must have had about 10 or 13 budgies each. We set down our shirts when we got to John O's. We put all the budgies. His mum wasn't bothered. She just, you know, we had come up with a stupid idea. We just said we found them. How'd you find like 26 budgies? <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's how it was. That was the kind of things we did. We, we, we did things that we thoroughly enjoyed. I mean, playing football, kicking them. Ball round in the tennis, play, play football all day long. I didn't get, you know, didn't let anyone see me because if my sisters or anyone see me, they tell me, "Oh, I get dragged in." Mm. And uh, yeah, it was it was a good it was a good time. As a, uh, was also you know it was a bit painful, but it it made me. I think it was one of the things that makes your character. It made me more determined. I think I didn't realize it at the time, but it did make me a determined young fellow. I was going to do something, I was going to do it. And I also remember people in the tenements in them days, they were all skint, you know, the wages weren't very high. And all, all the flats had coal fires. And I come up with this idea. The three of us, Porky, Joe, and myself, I said, it was a woman up the stairs who gave me the idea. She could Stand at the top of the stairs and she said, Can you see a coal man anywhere? Is there a coal man anywhere? I haven't got any coal left on this time. You're talking about coal. And I said, I'll get you some coal, Mrs. Doyle. I always remember her name because it was the first time I'd ever done anything like this. And she said, Where are you going to get coal from? I said, oh, I'll get you some. So I went down the stairs with John O and Porky and I said, Can we get any coal sacks? I said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to climb over Martindale. I said, and get some, fill the sacks up with coal. Don't have to fill them to the top. I said, um, we'll, we'll climb over the wall, drop the coal over the wall, then sell them. I think we were getting one, one of six or something for a bag of coal, which was, to the women in the tennies, it was, it was really, really cheap. And uh, 
we thought we'd, we'd hit the jackpot then. We were over there every night before I went, had to get be home. I had to be home for half eight in bed where on, on the door, so mm -hmm. behind the door. So we started robbing all this coal and uh, we made a few bob till somebody really started blowing us up. And once you start, my mother started asking where I was uh, getting all my food from, why I never, I wouldn't eat any tea because I hated the tea that I got from my mum. Maybe four pence of chips or something like that. When I, was, when I could eat cakes by going and robbing coal, that, that was the, that's what I used to do for pinching coal. That was my first episode into stealing, actually. Um, I didn't think of stealing, I just thought it was a, a bit of good fun and we could make, make a couple of bob. And uh, it went on from there. We had, you know, pigeons, they used to look after pigeons. And when I went to 268, the garden at the back was massive. And I was still kept collecting pigeons at the time as well. So I managed to get a, a hook, a loft built. Not very much, I mean, kids, all kids are doing with a hammer and nail. I've made a, got a loft going together. And also got some, with the money I was getting on the coal, I bought uh, two dozen day old chicks. And nobody ever asked me where I was getting all this money from in the house. I didn't, nobody realised, I used, they used to think I was robbing the chickens. Everything else, they say, I've got a out of such and such a place. And if you get caught doing that, if you bring the police to this door, you'll get a good hiding and all this, which I knew anyway. So I got these uh, two dozen chicks, day old chicks, and I looked after them. And they all survived except two. And I had them in the garden. We built a big um, coop for the, for the chickens. I used to be out there every day when I wasn't working or doing anything for my mum or doing messages. I'd be down and out in the garden with the chickens cleaning them out, doing all sorts and uh, making sure they were well looked after. I even had a pigeon in my bedroom, a pet, pet pigeon. No one's ever had a pet pigeon, I don't think, but I had a pet pigeon. And so I come home from school one day and it was lying on the ground outside, in front of the house. When I went in, I got a smack over the head. I said, what's that for? He said, you had a pigeon in your room. I said, it was lying on the ground. I said, yeah, because I threw it out. I didn't know it couldn't fly. I threw it out <laughs> the window. I was, <laughs> I was nearly, I was crying with laughter around the thing. I said, throwing a pigeon out the window, it couldn't fly. It was uh, just that kind of thing that happened. And, uh, is it the chickens you used to keep as well? I used to keep chickens and the reason I stopped with the chickens because I thought everybody was being good to me, let me keep these chickens. I didn't know what their motive was, or my mum's motive, or my dad's, or anybody's. As they, as they grew up, you know, the chickens were there. Uh, once they started to go missing, I had a big Rhode Island Red, which I'd robbed from Wilton. Uh, Got in the coops where, they, where all the chickens were a big farm, and I got to see this big Rhode Island red, and I got it in a corner. Anyway, of course, I got it, and I couldn't get it down the shit. It was that big, and <laughs> so I just got looking around the farm where it was, and I found a sack, and I just shoved it in the sack, and I just got, took it home like that, just put it over my shoulder, and uh, I had that for about six or seven months, and then it went missing, and uh, I found out afterwards that. Uh, one of my sisters had had its neck wrong and she'd taken it home and ate it. <laughs> I was really disappointed. But the most disappointing thing, and why I lost heart with, with keeping animals and chickens and things like that, was I came home from, I'd never had chicken in my life, never eaten chicken, didn't know what it was like. I came home from school this day, dinner time to do the messages as usual. And I was wondering what, what day it was, I was thinking, it's not Christmas, surely. It's not, can't, not, not Christmas. Because when I went in, I went downstairs in 268. Because that's where we used to live. It was down in the basement again. I don't know why people lived in basements. Maybe it's something to do with the war. But we were in the basement. And I sat down. And my mum said, Yeah, there's some chicken soup. I'd never had chicken soup in my life. I was looking around it, looking for the chicken. I was saying, there's no chicken in there. She said, the soup is chicken soup. It's not, not the chicken in there, it's a, that's soup. So I started to eat it and I thought, wow, this is amazing. This, 
this really does taste great. The next thing, I got mum said, yeah, there's a bit of chicken. It was a chicken's leg. And I, I was eating it, I was like, oh, that's brilliant. And so sarcastic, the sadistic brother, when I finished, said to me, do you know who that was? I said, who, who, what was? He said, that, that chicken. That was Gregory. And that was the first chicken I'd ever named. And they killed it and given it to me, given some of it to me to eat. And they told me afterwards who it was. And I was absolutely crying my eyes out. Always tried not to cry in that house if ever I could, if I could help it. I wouldn't cry, I'd hold it, hold it in, hold it in all the time. And this day I just couldn't, I couldn't hold it in. I just burst out crying. I thought, wow, what a terrible thing. To me, it was like someone had just murdered somebody for me, just killed. I'd looked after these chickens from a day old, and then gradually, over the next two weeks, they just killed them all and give them all to all my other brothers and sisters who were married and that. And that was the end of me keeping chickens. But it was the start of me getting more and more determined and more determined to get away from that house. But I think what really done it for me was Ed Jog. He was in the army, Ed Jog. He was older than me. Yeah. And uh, he's got, he, I didn't know at the time that he'd, he'd gone absent without leave. AWOL, as they call it. I, I called it desertion. I didn't know he deserted. And, uh, unbeknownst to me, he broke into his mother's um, gas meter and taken the money out, which was a terrible thing to do anyway. Mm. And I was going across the road to the tennis and jump up. Then Ed Jog come running up. And I said, Do you want to go to pictures? I said, I haven't got any money. He said, I'll pay for you. He said, Yeah. Here's one of six. I said, no, what's, what, what's that for? He said, You can have it. He said, Yeah. And he gave me five shilling. Well, that was an amazing amount of money for me. Five shilling. Wow. Yeah, come on. I'll go to pictures. Yeah, well, I was buying ice creams and all the rest of it. Didn't know he'd taken it out of his all these silver shillings. I should have known, like, because I used to get silver shillings from my mum's meter when she was running out of gas and electric, I used to have to go and get a silver shilling, is what they called them. And uh, apparently he got caught. Well, he did get caught, not apparently. He did get caught. I mean, he told the police that, you know, it was him. He broke into his mother's meter and this, that, and the other. And they asked him what he'd done with the money, and he, he told them that he'd given me five shillings. Come round to the house. He arrested me. He pinned that on you. Yeah, they arrested me for receiving stolen goods, and I said I didn't know it was stolen the money. I didn't know, it. but that was didn't that didn't wash that. They just said you must have known. It gives you five shillings. It gives you five shillings for nothing. And uh, I never admitted anything. I got taken down to the police station, and uh, they got let out. Another same thing again. Dad came down to bear me out, give me a hide, and I went to him. And uh, that was when I was making a cup of tea. Just before I'd started making a cup of tea, and one day I was waiting to go to court, and that's when Fry, one of the brothers, one of the other brothers, kept my teeth in, had the teeth hanging down, hanging up, hanging, hanging by the nerves. I was, I was in a terrible mess. But it didn't stop the police taking me down to court a few days, a week later, with all these broken teeth. And, uh, I got put on remand in Morton Jail while I was waiting. It's actually under the under the um, St. George's Hall. The prison cells are underneath the George's Hall. They're probably still there to this day, I should imagine. And that's where I had to wait. No one came to see me. No one came to ask what, what was going on. And I was just arrested. Uh, I was put on remand to Walton Prison. The age I was, I think I was about 15, 16, 16, I think it was, round about. And I went to jail, went into the young prisoners. I went up to court, Judge Lasky. And uh, they asked, was there anybody there with me? I said, no, did they? I didn't say no, the prison officer said, no, he's on his own, Your Honour. 
there's nobody turned up. They've been, I've been informed that he'd be in court this morning, but nobody's turned up. And nobody did turn up. I got put down, back down the cells in case somebody was coming late, but they didn't, so I got taken back up again after a, an hour or so. And uh, Judge Lasky said he was giving me another chance. He was going to send me to Borsla for no less than nine months, no more than three years. And I went to Borsla. I went back to Walton Jail. Stayed there for a few weeks. Then we went to Strange Ways. Stayed there. Hey? When you were 15? Yeah. 15, 16, I think I was. Went to Strange Ways. Spent a few weeks in Strange Ways. Then I went up to um, Wimber Scrubs. Uh, we used to go to Wimber Scrubs to get allocated to the Borsla. And all this time, nobody had been in touch. Nobody had bothered. No, nobody made inquiries about me. I got sent to Weatherby Borsla by Weatherby Racecourse, right next to Weatherby Racecourse. Apparently, it was a, an ex naval base, and they were changing them into the Borsla wings and all the rest of it. And uh, I spent quite a Quite a long time in that place. In fact, that's where they, they fixed my teeth there. I got taken down to the local dentist, which is about the only good thing that ever happened to me in, in, in Borsal. And uh, they asked me what had happened to me. I said, Oh, one of my elder brothers kicked my teeth in. And he said, You kicked your teeth in? I said, Yeah. I think that's the first time someone had ever felt sorry for me. So he said, We'll have to see if we can get them fixed. I gave him the duty, he did fix them, they a bit of a mess, but the teeth that they gave me were better than the ones that I had in me. <laughs> so, you know, I kept them in until I joined the army. And uh, nobody came to see me at, well, in, uh, at Weatherby. Nobody wrote. I didn't write anyway, because I couldn't write. And I couldn't write. I never learned to spell. When you're at that age and you can't spell, you don't want to tell anybody. So I never told anyone. But every time I went up to get see if I could get me release, because you were doing from nine months to three years, but you could be let out any time after nine months. And Weatherby was supposed to be a nine month, what they call a nine month borsal, where you went in there, and as long as you got a visit, got visits, regular visits, and people wrote to you, you got a good chance of getting out. You got a good chance of getting out early. But nobody did that for me. Nobody came to see me. Nobody wrote to so me. So that, that prolonged your sentence. That prolonged my sentence, and uh, I did over two years. And but obviously, by the time I come out, I was I was getting quite big as well at the time. At the same time as uh, I was starting to put weight on. And I, I'd obviously uh, still had a bit of uh, growth growth left in me, and I, I was getting a bit taller and bigger. I started to go to the gym when I was there. Get myself fit. I don't know what for. I was just wanting to get myself fit and get ready for work when I went out. And then I thought, I think I'll join the uh, the army. I think I'll, I'll join the parachute regiment. And when I was talking to these um, screws, they used to come round and talk to you in the in the common room. What yeah, where all the all the Boston lads used to go and. Relax or relax or play stakes and ladders and chess and stuff like that. And they come over and they said to me, What are you going to do when you get out, Fleetwood? I said, I'm going to join the army. He said, Well, are you? well that's good if you can get in. It'd be good if you can get into the army. So, what regiment are you going to join? I said, I'm going to join the parachute regiment. And these three screws just burst out laughing. You'll never get in the palace, you. You think you were getting the Pioneer Corps? The Pioneer Corps was probably the worst regiment in, in the British Army. They did all the cleaning up and brushing up after the horses and brush cleaning billets out and all, all, all the rubbish jobs they used to do, peeling spuds and you know. And uh, I just thought to myself, you don't, I, but this, this is why I knew I was getting some determination. I thought, I'm going to join the party. Never said anything to them again about it. And he'd come in a few days later and say, Hey, Fleetwood, what are you going to tell the tent officers on? So, what are you going to do when you get out of the army? I said, I've got to rob a bank. <laughs> and they said, All sorts. You're trying to be funny. So, I thought, Well, I'm not getting out until I've done me three years in here. So, I'm not bothered. I'll just do what I want. So, I started becoming a bit obnoxious. And, uh, 
really, really bullshit. But it's done for you. I was, I was getting to be, you become a part of big lads, man. You know, I just had to put weight on and that because I was getting all these regular food. I didn't know you could get three meals in one day. I didn't think anyone <laughs> would eat that much stuff. But I learned to eat it, really did. I learned pretty quick as well. And uh, of course, with me, with my newfound teeth as well, it was, uh, I'd become a bit of a lad. And as I say, when I came out of there, I did get out after two years. I think he just wanted to get rid of me. I'd been in there longer than anybody. Um, I'd actually seen people coming into the Boston, going out and coming back before while I was still in there. And, uh, I imagine you, you were there longer than some of the staff. Oh, well, well, actually, there was. <laughs> and I, I had pigeons as well, and believe it or not, they let me keep pigeons in the Boston. And uh, it was it was quite amazing. They were there before I got there, but when I said I was interested in, you know, pigeons and things like that, they said, we've got a pigeon lock there. You can look after the pigeon locks. I was like, I was absolutely delighted. Mm. And I, I, did, I, I did get to look after them. I was there every day looking at them before I went to work down on the building site where they were doing all the changing all the the naval place into, into a proper like a prison it was they were turning it into and I used to be up there all the time looking after them cleaning them out really having a good it was a relaxing thing for me to do to be able to look after pigeons and animals because that's where I really started my life off was at St Eddie's in, on the farm it's really really I suppose I got the, the liking for yeah. all the animals and it was quite a thing it, wasn't as bad as getting beaten up every five minutes in the yeah. house and things like that. It was beginning to, life was beginning to change, change a little bit for me. And I, when I came out, I got a job. I didn't, jobs were easy to get in them days. You could get a job and lose it and get another job the next day. It was that easy to get a job. So I went down to sell and window cleaners. I was only walking, but I didn't go down there specifically, down Mount Pleasant. And I was walking past and I seen this place, window cleaner place. Um, when the cleaners wanted. I just walked over and just said, uh, can I have a job? Said, and that's how, it, that's how it was. You just said, can I have a job? Said, yeah, yeah. When can you start? And uh, I started cleaning windows. It was all down the town. My, my round was in the town with all the shops, all owners, Lions, uh, Tea House, and all the big shops all, all around. Marks and Spencers, the whole lot of them. And I used to clean all the big windows. I, I loved doing that because I didn't actually love doing the windows. I loved being in the big shops because I could just walk past the cake counter and just pick a cake up and <laughs> eat it and go drink it, whatever. Then did no one ever bothered me. They just just because I was the window lad, the chamois lad over my shoulder and just walk in with a little ladder on my shoulder as well. Just pick a cake up and eat it, and no one said anything. It was it was Aladdin's cave for me. It was uh, I wasn't really let loose in anywhere like that in my life because everybody you're automatically a thief before you know anyone knew it. And uh, yeah, and I went from there, I went down the town to Pall Mall, and that's where I joined the army when I seen the recruiting signs outside, army recruiting. And I walked in and said the same thing to this fella. I said, I want to join, join the army. And they all spoke to you the same, they all say to you, what, you, what regiment do you want to join? I said the parachute regiment, and they burst out laughing. I, I said, "Why is everyone start laughing when I said the parachute regiment?" And he said, "Why?" I said, "I said to some other fellow, I said I want to join the parachute." And he started laughing. I said, "Why? What's so funny about joining the parachute regiment?" He said, "Well, you just don't seem like the kind of a fellow who'd get in the parachute regiment." I said, "Why?" And he said, well, "You've got to be, you got to be, you know, fit. You've got to be big. You've got to be, you know, got to be able to look after yourself." I said, "I can look after myself." Anyway, they let me give me the forms to fill in. And I said to this sergeant, recruiting sergeant, I was in the room with him on my own, and I said to him, uh, I'll, I'll have to tell you something. I said, I, said I, can't, I can't write. I said, so I'm, I won't be able to join. join it. He said, yeah, give us it, I'll fill it in for you. And that's how easy it was to join the army. They were desperate for men. They were absolutely desperate. It wasn't long after the war. And they were just desperate to get men in. Soldiers of the 60s, we were called. Uh, yeah, I joined the Paris. I remember going home. Never told anyone when I went home. I'd already signed. And I had to go down. They asked me when I wanted to go, and I said today. And he said, "You can't just go today. You only just fill your forms in today." <laughs> so I said, "Well, when can I come back? 
when, when do I have to, when can I go? He said, go, come back next week. You'll have a, you'll have a medical and then you'll take your oath and you'll get the Queen's shilling. I said, what is it in the Queen's shilling? What, what's that? He said, we'll give you the shilling when you sign the forms. I said, it's joined up for six years. We'll give you the shilling. I said, is that all? <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's a symbol of what you, you, you're fighting for the Queen. I'm going to give you the Queen's shilling. That's what it does. That's what it is. It's symbolic. I said, oh, okay. I didn't know what symbolic meant. <laughs> I just stood on. And uh, they let me, let me join up. And when I went down to get a travel once, I as I said, I didn't know him. Never been out of Liverpool in my life. And uh, so, what, how, do you get a mobilisation date? Pretty soon. Yeah, they give you. They, they, they used to give it you there and then. When I, when I signed up for the show, and he said, "When do you want to go?" I said, "Well, can I go tomorrow?" I said, can I? He said, "You really want to get away? You don't." <laughs> I said, do you? "I said, yeah." He said, "Want to join the army?" I said, "Well, come down for one journey. I want to go now." He said, "You can go tomorrow." He said, "You have to come back in about half an hour or an hour." He said, "Give me an hour. I'll get you warrant ready." And uh, I said, "Well, what's a warrant?" He said, "A warrant is so you can get on the train." He said, "Are you thick?" I said, "Yeah." Because I was just being as funny as him. I said, "Yeah." I said, "I don't. I've never had a warrant. What, what does it do?" He said, "It gets you on the train and it'll take you all the way to all the shows." And when you come back, I'll explain it to you. So I went back an hour later, and he was there. To get to True to his word, he had the warrant ready for me. I said, yeah, there's your warrant. You get this at Lime Street, you get off at uh, Euston Station, you get another train to Waterloo, and from Waterloo, it'll take you straight into Aldershot. When you get to Aldershot, you ask them where Maiden Barracks is. It's not far from the station. You can walk there, just up the hill. He said, and that's the part of your regiment depot, that's where they do the training, and that's where you're going. And the best of luck to you. <laughs> And I went, I went home, didn't say anything to anybody, got up the next morning and one of my brothers was downstairs, my mum, my mum said, why didn't you get up for work? I said, well, I'm not going to work anymore. She said, what do you mean? She said, what are you doing with your suit on? It was a suit I'd got on tick, I think it only cost about two quid, the suit, but it was the only suit I'd ever had in my life. And uh, so well, what's the toothbrush doing in your pocket? <laughs> and I had the toothbrush stuck in my top pocket. I said, I've joined the army. He said, what? You've joined the army? And our Jim said, what regiments have you joined? I said, the parachute regiment. And he said, he, started, he burst out laughing. I thought, there's something wrong here. I've joined the wrong regiment for some reason. Everyone keeps laughing. And uh, he said, you never do parachutes. You don't get the parachutes, you. You do the parachute regiments. Do you know what the parachute regiment does? They jump out of airplanes. I said, I don't know. I didn't know, actually. I just thought, <laughs> I just thought it was the name of the, the regiment. And I was walking out the door. I was like, I'm going to jump out of airplanes. <laughs> I was really excited about this now. And when I got there, I went to the guard room when I got through all the shots. Long train journey. And he said, uh, What's it? What do you want? Because I was just stood by the guard room because it just had parachute regiment depot, parachute regiment written on the on the side. And I said, I'm, I'm joining the paras. I said, I've just been told it's here somewhere. He said, Well, this is the parachute regiment, this is the depot. This, have you come for a new, new recruit? I said, well, well, I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. Even foreign language to me, recruits <laughs> and all the rest of it. And I said, I don't. I said, I've just I've joined the parachute regiment, I've been sent up here. And this is, he said, Where's your case? I said, I haven't got a case. He said, well, have you brought any stuff with you? I said, yeah, I've got a toothbrush. <laughs> and he started laughing as well. I thought, what's the matter with this place? I'm on another, you know, something wrong with me or something. And he just said, oh, come on, mate. He said, I'll show you. He said, I'll take you down to where you're going to be sleeping, your billet. Your billet. He said, uh, you'll have to come back up after, after lunch, he said, and uh, get yourself kitted out. He said, come back about three o'clock. Come back up here. So he took me down a bit. I came back up at three o'clock and he'd given me all these clothes, denims and all the rest of it. I went back down. There was only about four of us in, in the billets. And uh, that's when I started my army life. And that was uh, the start of a much better life for me. Mm. I couldn't believe it. I, I did everything, everything that was asked of me. 
when I realized that I'd learned more about the paras and I'd, I was doing a bit of this and a bit of that and running, trying to do this sort of courses and yeah. I was really into it and I could I beat anybody around this sort of course and they didn't like it, they really didn't like it. But what they didn't realize is I'd been in Borsal, I'd been running and doing all sorts in Borsal for, you know, for a long time before. And I've been running all around Liverpool all my life, non-stop by the feel of it. Getting chased. Yeah, chased <laughs> by everybody, yeah. Getting, you know, getting away, doing things. And I was good, I was becoming, you know, getting a bit of a reputation. And uh, when they realised they could fight as well, when they, when they put me in the ring, in the middle, they put me in with this big blonde fella. He must have been about six foot three. I would climb up steps to get in, and I just looked at him. I think, Lord, the size of them. When when the bell went, I just went straight across and started knocking seven count, seven bells out of him. And the next thing, he's he's on his knees, and uh, that's when he tried to get me in the boxing team. I joined the boxing team, but I was only only in the boxing team for about you know, six weeks at the most. And I uh, went in for my first fight with somebody out of one power. And I just fucking did bang, 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 bang. And this fella hurt me, didn't half hit me. Murray, his name was. And uh, I just went over and stuck the head on him. Well, <laughs> I was dragged out of that ring. I was struggling, I struggled in the cell. I thought, oh, here we go again. <laughs> I said, what's the. She said, you can't butt people. Yeah, I'm just going and butt someone. I tell you, he didn't half hurt me. He said, don't care what they hurt you. are not supposed to get hurt in the ring. <coughs> but uh, they just threw me out of the boxing boxing team. I only lasted six weeks. One fight, six weeks, and I was gone. I was out. But I, I, that one thing had created such a reputation for me. I never stopped fighting from that day on. I was fighting with everybody. It was. Uh, I just loved it. <laughs>